This is the Born to Be podcast, where we believe you were created on purpose and for a purpose. Each week, we deliver inspiration and interviews with today's top thought leaders who are living out their unique calling every single day. Are you ready to discover your true identity and become who you were born to be? The future is yet to be created. And now, here's your host, Darren Earlywine. Welcome back to the Born to Be podcast. Uh, Darren Earlywine, your host. And, you know, you have people in your life that you meet and you feel like maybe you're on a, a somewhat parallel journey. Maybe you see portions of yourself in them. Uh, and then you, 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 you're not as connected, but the cool thing about Facebook and life is that you can just continue to root for all their new adventures uh, that, they're, that, that they're on because you're on them. And especially if you listen to the Born to Be podcast, you listen because maybe you are a pioneer. You're not, you're more of an apostolic leader. You're more of an entrepreneur. And you're trying to figure out exactly how you live that out. And as a fellow pioneer, as a fellow entrepreneur, as a fellow apostle, uh, that journey has a lot of ups and downs a lot of unforeseen turns, and uh, and I'm excited for this episode to uh, to introduce you to a friend of mine who's been a friend of mine for many, many years, uh, Lisa Mitchell, who uh, is a fellow pioneer, a fellow entrepreneur, fellow apostolic leader, and uh, your journey has had many ups and downs, new things, old things, continued things, and uh, it's just, I'm inspired by by what you're doing now, uh, Lisa, and the journey you've been on. So welcome to the Morning Week Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. So we met, I want to say, uh, at least, uh, like, I don't know, 15 years ago, I, maybe. I did the math on this this morning as, Please I help was, me. as I was thinking. So we met in January of 2005. 2005. Many, many moons ago. You were one of the first people I met when we moved to Fishers. Really? Yeah. Where did we first meet? Uh, at church. Yes. Yes. And then you guys helped me piece together that my neighbor guy behind me, who was, we dubbed them the house of shirtless men. Was yes. Our mutual friend, Adam. I, I and do so remember then that. my whole community started growing <laughs> from just, you know, asking questions. So, so yeah. W- you, uh, we, so we met in 2005 at that point, you, uh, had you started another business other than the job you had? No. At that point, I was straight up corporate ladder climber. That was my that was my jam. I was what ten years in, ah, eight years into my corporate career. Was all about climbing the ladder, looking for a, a VP or or something position in a big global corporate company. That was that was the only silo I had put myself in okay. or had allowed myself to be in. But yeah. there were inklings that there were other interests there that I just wouldn't let myself entertain. So where did you give us a story? Your first kind of entrepreneurial pioneering effort was with the coffee shop, correct? Yeah. So where did the seeds of that? You're just going along. You've got a thought. I'm climbing the corporate ladder. I'm doing the thing. Oh, left turn. How about we try a coffee shop? Yeah. Well, they were concurrent, actually. So they weren't mutually exclusive endeavors. They were running side by side. And um, I have a habit of being a little overly optimistic on the ambition channel. So it's like, yes, and. Yeah. It's pretty much my answer for everything. Right. Yes, I'll do this and I'll do that, mm-hmm. um, which is still a trend that continues to present moment. Uh, I had done a business plan for a coffee shop as part of my master's program, and we had relocated. Um, my husband at the time and I had moved here, and I was driving two hours. Well, I was driving three hours every single day back and forth to Fort Wayne wow. for work because my office was still in Fort Wayne, and that was supposed to be very temporary, and then life happened and all sorts of wrenches got thrown in. And so me leaving that company to do something at home didn't happen, but I was already underway with mm-hmm. co- with the coffee shop. Mm-hmm. Um, I was annoyed that I had to go across the interstate to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> and there was no place of real like community or space for people to just have conversations or to work or whatever close to, to where we lived because we were at that time, that was kind of a new part of, of the city. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like, well, I can do that. How hard can it be? Right. So we started shopping the business plan and people gave us money and was like, yep, go ahead. Have fun. Go build your thing. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> Before you know it, you guys, you, you opened it. Uh, what's called Common Grounds? It was Higher Grounds. Higher Grounds. Yeah. So you start Higher Grounds Coffee and before, in, in a pretty short amount of time, you end up having two or three actual locations. We had four. Four. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my lesson in that is that just because... Uh, the answer is yes doesn't mean it's your best yes. 
So uh, the discernment of like, is this the right thing at the right time was not a filter that I ran those decisions through. It was just more is better and yes is good and there'll never be another time. So we have to do it now. Wow. Um, in retrospect, extremely misguided. Um, a, a little more thoughtfulness around this. Is this the best yes for our family and for the time that we're in and for the you know financial situation we're in and the people we're serving? Just none of those questions. It was just like, oh, well, they said yes, so it must be the right thing to do. Yeah. How old were you guys when you were doing this? Um, 28. So I mean, like as I a, was 28, so late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. I think a lot of times when we're, you know, mid 20s, we 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 feel like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm 28, I'm not 18. Obviously, I'm really mature in right. what I'm doing. My experience was I, I was extremely immature at 28, but I still had the drive and ambition of of a pioneer, of of a, a an entrepreneur. And like you yeah. said, for my personality, oftentimes you know, on the, on the Enneagram, I'm a seven. So the, the phrase too. for a Enneagram for an Enneagram seven is more is better. Yep. So like you said, more right is better. Yep. It's always yes. And is there any way for seven, you know, Enneagram seven apostolic pioneer entrepreneur people to really learn the maturity of that decision-making without okay. crashing the car a couple of times? <laughs> I'm probably not the best one to ask because I repeatedly crash just to see what happens. Um, it's kind of my MO. I enjoy the I enjoy the adventure. Um, I think really where you can anchor in on that is like I have a very strong personality. If I want to do something or I think something is right, like you're going to have to like legit restrain me and talk sense into me and get my full attention because mm-hmm. I'm already seeing it yeah. and I'm just running towards it. Mm-hmm. So I think having those strong anchors in your whether it's I don't think family is the best choice to be that anchor. Yeah. Um, especially if you have a family that has a scarcity mindset or aren't entrepreneurial or aren't, because they're just going to tell you no all the time because they're afraid for you yeah. in, in a loving way, but they're yeah. afraid for you. Yes. Right. So that's just frustration. And, and then the rebellious child comes out and then you just go do what you want to do anyway. Screw them. Right. <laughs> so I think you have to have kind of neutral third party advisors. Yeah. Um, of all ages and, and experience levels yeah. to give you their perspective and help you see your blind spots. Yeah, because right. they're there. Right. And for me, it's like, and this is from someone who's failed like massively multiple times. I assume it's going to go well. Yeah. Even now. Yeah. Like I have tons of evidence to the contrary that it can end very differently. Yeah. And I still approach everything assuming it will go well. But don't you think if you're if you're going to be an effective or continue to live the life of a, of a pioneer of an entrepreneurial that that that's in you, like you you kind of right. have to have it to jump, don't you? You do. You do. You have to have that inherent kind of risk taker um, mentality, but you can just because you're a risk taker doesn't mean you should jump without a parachute. Yeah. Right. So it's I have become more um, I've slowed my pace and I have become more aware of guardrails Mm -hmm. and have sought out guardrails and will sit down and ask people, what am I not seeing about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and those people that are invested in me and, and that love me and want good things or aren't and just no business or no the, the industry I'm looking at will be like, hey, this is this is where this is falling short. This is what you might trip over. This is what you haven't considered. And then at least I'm working with better data Yeah. before yeah. I jump. One of the things that's helped me in that, and it could be a resource for you as you're listening, is um, in our spiritual DNA workshop, one of the sessions is uh, based around what we call your five-fold function or, uh, and, and sometimes we call it your, your voice in the world. And there's two free places you can go to take this assessment. One of them is called fivefoldsurvey.com. Or you could go to five voices, literally the number five voices.com if you're looking in more of the, the corporate setting. Um, but if you are a, an entrepreneur, if you're a pioneer um, or what we might call an apostle, one of the key partners you need, and it's, it's been a huge help for me, is to find someone who uh, is a creative or another word for that is a prophet, someone who, uh, who, who moves at a solar place, somebody who can ask great questions, somebody who has the insight and discernment that you might not have. And most most of the efforts I've had that have succeeded in a more of an entrepreneurial pioneering phase have been when I had somebody riding shotgun with me that was a profit creative that was able to say, hey, how about we turn this coin over and look at the other side, ask good questions and allow me to to actually grow in that discernment phase. Yes, exactly. That is that is super key. I would agree with that 100 percent. The interesting caveat to that is when you are seeking counsel, you have to be aware of their um. I hate to use the word agenda, right? But you have to be aware of how they're looking to leverage you. Hmm. And not every 
not every relationship like that is transactional yeah. in nature, but many, many, especially in the entrepreneurial space is. And people that will provide counsel to you who are credentialed and invested and really care about seeing you achieve an outcome, maybe because that outcome is best for them mm, yeah, and how the role they want you to play yeah. and not maybe the outcome that's best for you as a person or for your family or even in the long run. It's almost like I hear you saying like you almost need to have like a, a, a me team and then there's like the team for, for maybe the cause. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You, you need to have stake, stakeholders that have different skin in the game or no skin in the game at all other than to just love on you and, and be a guardrail for you and a support system for you. But um, they don't always have the depth of knowledge yeah. to balance it out. So So for me, it's it's getting counsel and rooting into people who have a, a variety of levels of investment in yeah, me yeah. and ties to my outcomes. Yeah. Give me right now what you would say if you handed me your business card. You say, hey, I'm Lisa Mitchell and this is boom. Give me your who are you right oh, now? If only it were so succinct. You're <laughs> funny. You're funny. You know me. You know how you know how this answer goes. Um, right now, I am primarily a mother to an amazing 13 year old daughter who lights up my life and keeps me accountable because man, oh, man, does she keep me accountable. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's that's job number one. Um, and then I'm also founder of Power Body Language, which is a communications consulting company um, that manifests its services in all sorts of ways. Executive coaching, corporate training, um, helping people figure out how they're showing up in a room and how to leverage that to help them or at least not hurt them. Yeah. Um, how to read other people so you're working with better data during decision making processes, negotiations, uh, hiring, interviewing, all of that stuff. Uh, and then really just with the goal of helping people show up as their mo most confident clued in self in any room. Yeah. Like that's my mission. That's like a million deep. If I can give you a set of skills that helps you love how you show up. Yeah. And yeah. feel good about just who you are inherently, not the not what you produce for someone, but just the space that you occupy. Yeah. Like see, then I've succeeded. See, I love that mission and I love just hearing you say it, I'm like, yes. Like I'm drawn in. I want I want to know more about that. And I I'm drawn in to know, okay, how did you learn that? So it's like, I know a little bit, you know, of your story, a little behind the scenes and I've gotten to watch, but, but I think everybody wants to be able to get to the place where they can confidently say something like you just said, I have a mission. Yeah. Here's what I want to do. I want to impact the life of a million people, but like, uh, but I'm, I'm right here. Like, how do I get to that space? Yeah. You know, how do I get to the place to be able to say something like that? So, you know, you, you've had a lot of entrepreneurial journeys, you've had wins, you've had losses, but I guess maybe connect some of the dots of of how do you get to the place where you can say, you know what, this this is my mission. Yeah, it comes from a great amount of relational pain. Like pain is the best teacher, right? Mm. It's learning what you what you don't want to feel or experience again and then equipping yourself with tools that help you avoid that same outcome. So for me, everything is a everything's a grand experiment. Right? I wear a bracelet that says life is pure adventure. Because it is. And if you view it as anything else, you're going to be frustrated or disappointed or sad all the time. Um, so for me, the the catalyst specifically around really going deep and, and falling down the rabbit hole of all things communications and interpersonal was during the most trying, during the most trying parts of my life, professionally and personally, mine just happened to coincide. Like into 2018, 2019 was a year of devastation. Like everything fell apart. My business, my marriage. Um Lots of relationships were damaged. I lost who I was. Just everything was blown up with, in the space of about uh, two weeks on all fronts all at the same time. Wow. When was this? Um, end of 2008 and 2009. Okay. I thought you said 18, 19. Yeah. I'm like, no. that, that was I just like have, three weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, no, 2008, 2009. And then 2010 was a year of attorneys, attorney fees and courtrooms. Um. So in that span and in those lessons, I learned that like when I when I got really serious, because I could say, oh, well, you know, my my husband did this or, oh, my business did this or, oh, like there's a, a lots of lots of things I could have assigned blame to. But when I really got honest with myself in, in those moments of like ownership, it was like, no, this is you. Mm. Like I quit paying attention to what was going on around me because I was drowning like internally. I was so overwhelmed that. I couldn't expend the energy to even try to look for what other people were telling me or more importantly, showing me. Mm. I just sh shut down. And when I, when I look back 
and there's lots of reasons, you know, overwhelm and whatnot. Um, it was like I did not have the ownership of of seeing other people. I just quit looking See, and I, went I, internally and just missed so many cues and so many warnings and so many guardrails yes. that would have kept me out of a lot of those situations. So, so you said pain has been the teacher, and that's something we talk about often on the podcast, yeah. right? That so often when you look back and, and you see the greatest places of pain, they they can they can be used as a great crucible to create to create new passion. Yeah. Because you've suffered through that. You have something to learn. You have something to teach. You have something to stand on. But oftentimes, like people don't they, they don't look at that pain. They don't have the time in that to, to have that introspection and go, you know what? Like what's gonna actually hurt more right now yeah. is for me to to own, yeah, this was my part of it and learn from it. A lot of I think most often it's like I'm going to just continue to deflect this. I'm yeah. going to continue to, to sh- distract myself. I did that too for a while. Like let's let's put some context around this like ownership discovery using it for positive benefit. It's been 10 years. Hmm. For the first the first 2 years is survival mode. Like holy crap, what does my life look like now? Sure. I'm a single mom. I moved away. My business is done. Like what is which way's up, Yeah, yeah right? Like yeah. that's the first phase. And then it's like, you kind of go through that, oh, it's everybody else's fault or denial or whatever. It's like, you know, the five stages of death yeah. and dying, right? Yeah. And and it's not until you get into that. And I was like, I will never have another business. Like, I will never be an entrepreneur again. I'm never taking any risk. I'm sticking with my corporate career. Um, I'm done. This sucks. It's hard. It hurts. It mm. destroyed everything. Yeah. And yet, right? <laughs> And yet, here we are. And yet, here we are. Right. So I, I think there's something like you have to give yourself the time and space to work through all of those, all of those phases. Um, because I just, I literally took my ball and went home. Like I hid. Basically, I, I moved away. I severed all my old relationships. I, um, even like friends, family, everybody. I just kind of moved into my own space and created my own environment and really just stayed on my island for a couple of years. So can you go back and uh, you're not there now? No. You're back in the game. You're back in the hustle. Yeah. So can you go back? Are there, there are there little like maybe, you know, landmarks or signpost moments where you started to feel the, the tide turn a little bit, where you began to take some of that ownership, where you began to, to, to reconnect relation, maybe where you began to say, you know what? Maybe I will risk again. I'm just going to learn from this and not let yeah. this be something that, that sinks me. What What were some turning point moments back there? Can you think of some? Yeah, I think it was as my kind of inner peacefulness returned, I was able to reengage outwardly again. And that, you know, that took a, a lot of a lot of forms. But as I started to get. I started to get discontent on purpose, like mm-hmm. for me, it was like, yes, what I'm doing is fine. But fine is not good and fine's not bringing me joy and fine is not lighting me up, right? So I fought that. I stayed in my corporate job probably two or three years longer than I should have just because I'm stubborn. Hmm. I'm like, I'm not doing anybody any good. I only really have to work about two hours a day. I make great money, have full benefits, work remotely. I'm not accountable to anybody. Like, I should love this gig. Yeah. And I was completely discontent. I'm like, I am not having an impact. I was made, I was made for more, right? And you tried, I ran, I tried to run from that. I'm like, shut up, you're fine, right? Mm. Like I would have this. Yeah. <laughs> this Invent like, yourself. Here's all the reasons you should purpose. be fine, right? Like this is, you're, just shut up and be, be grateful for what you have and just cruise. Like you are on autopilot. You don't have to engage. You don't have to put effort out. Like this is where most people think they want to be. Yeah. And in theory, if you stay there, you're you're also protecting yourself from a repeat of the yeah. pain of the stuff that just fell down. Yeah, this is safe. This is good. And then I got curious. And for me, like I, you know, my my gravestone will probably read "Curiosity got her here," right? <laughs> because for me, it's that curiosity of like, oh, I want to know that. I want to know that. I want to know more. And once I once I it was like the gateway drug, right? Like I started doing some reading and I started engaging in some courses and getting active in some communities. It just lit me up again. Hmm. And there was no going back. There was like, I have to, like, I've got to, I've got to run after this because I feel alive. I feel excited. I feel like I don't know what my thing is yet, but I am equipping myself from an education and a, and a knowledge and a skill set that when I do, when that thing pings with me, yeah. I can build it. So you, you said a kind of joking way that it could be what, you know, that 
on your gravestone. The curiosity is what got you. But let's say someone's there and they're stuck. Yeah. They're stuck in the fear. They're stuck in the pain. Would you would you prescribe then embrace curiosity? Absolutely. Curiosity is the answer for almost everything that's wrong with you. Hmm. Because curiosity, you can't be curious and inactive at the same time. By definition, curiosity is is movement. There's a sound right? bite for you right there. Like curiosity is movement. And once your brain gets curious about something and you satisfy that curiosity, then it's what's next. So it keeps you moving. Like for me, the curiosity of like, oh my gosh, I'm so, so fascinated by people who can read body language and, um, you know, and, and where that takes you, I want to know more. Mm-hmm. And then I knew more and I'm like, that's an amazing application. I want to know more. And I just kept going into this, I want to know more. And I've been in forward movement every single day since. See, I love that, Lisa. And one thing that, you know, I'll bring it back to the, the, the spiritual filter is I really believe that, like, here's a great question. Like, where do good ideas come from? Where do the great ideas come from? Where do the great songs come from? Where do the great inventions come from? In my opinion, right, is that God created everything and he is the most creative being in the universe. And I think he has creative ideas that he's looking for someone to borrow for a 100. while. One hundred. I just got goosebumps, by the way. That's truth. That's so my truth signal. Is, is goosebumps? Yep. Good. Yep. And so for you, I love what you said, Lisa, is that, that curiosity probably is the prescription for everything that ails you. It is. It, in your marriage, in your relationships with your parents, in your parenting. Yep. is. And we talk about it you know, on radio. Theology talk about it on the show. And I think I stole this from uh, Brene Brown. I've stolen it from... Uh, what's her name, Dr. Uh, Christine Neff, I think, her book, Self-Compassion, is so often when we, when if we, the opposite, I think, of, of curiosity is when we begin to condemn ourselves for the, for our our mistakes, our failings, or we beat ourselves up for whatever, wherever we're at. But if you could just get to the place of embracing, like, let me just get curious. Now what I'm doing is I'm giving, I'm giving the creator of the universe access to the, one of the most powerful things I have is my mind and my ability to be creative and him just continue to kind of season my thoughts yep. with, hey, I've got a really cool idea. I'm looking for somebody that would be willing to borrow it for a while. Yeah. And it sounds like that's the journey that, that took you to where you are. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's still like I never considered myself a creative until I started getting into this work. And I'm a process driven person. I'm very pragmatic. I like flow charts like Visio was my jam back in the day. Right. Like I could process map anything um, because that was safe and there wasn't a lot of creativity or ingenuity and or risk, right? If mm. you can process map, if everything's got a swim lane, then everything has to end well. Yeah, right. Right. So <laughs> I was optimistic based on systems. Now I'm optimistic based on expecting that that creative, that creative force, that opportunity to yeah. create will show up for me, right? Yeah. So I'm a builder and I'm a creative now, which is not at all how I would ever describe myself. Mm. Um, but that's exactly how most of my most impactful uh systems, programs, talks, whatever, however I deliver things has come to me. It's been a spark of curiosity that then like taps me on the shoulder at 3 a.m. and is like, here's here's what you need to say about that. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I keep a notepad and a pen by my bed or I will text notes if I'm too lazy to like turn a light on or email myself in the middle of the night. Like my email is hilarious because I wake up and there's like, oh, all these articles to write or blog posts to have or things to learn or ways to apply what I already know that can help somebody in a, in a specific way mm. or somebody's name will come to me that I'm like supposed to reach out to or reconnect with. Right. So it's just like, I am open. I, I ask, I mm. ask to receive that creativity, that, that mm. knowledge, that discernment. Like I'm, I'm actively every day asking for it yeah. and I've quit complaining about it when it shows up at 3 AM. Mm. Right. Yeah. Like creativity is not convenient, yeah. extremely inconvenient. It's exhausting. It's frustrating. And you might have to iterate on something a hundred times before it pings with you like that. Yes. That's what was trying to be channeled through me. And yes. now I finally have obeyed and been open and done the work enough to like receive that. I love it. Listen, that's worth the price of admission right there. If you're at the beginning step one of the journey or literally if you're looking at the you know smoldering remains of a dream you went after and you're going, how do I start? How do I start again? Uh, cur- uh, curiosity curiosity about the pain, curiosity about ideas, just embrace an openness. I love what you said, Lisa, is there's an openness to receive it, but there's, you got to start paying attention yes. for, for where it's going to show and up. And you have to do the work hmm. when it knocks. Yes. Right. People think, oh, I can, I'm going to be inspired and I'm going to write a book and a, no, no, you're not like you might, 
that might be a huge blessing that you receive at some point and good for you. I'll never hate on you for it. Right. But like that is not the day to day. Mm. Like the day to day of a creative is mental exhaustion and like wanting to just throw everything away. <laughs> <laughs> like, Sorry, if you're looking for pretty words, I'm not I'm not the girl for you. Right. But but I want people to be equipped because you get into this space. And if nobody's ever told you that and nobody's ever been real because we see all these, you know, overnight overnight sensations or people that are massively viral or people that like have it all figured out. If if there's nobody in that middle space who's doing the work right now, there's the people who don't know what they want to do or are just starting that are all inspiration and motivation. There's the people that are already there that are are monetizing their ideas and, and and leading the pack on others and showing the after picture. But there's nobody really talking about the work in the middle. Mm. Right. And I've had this conversation with people that are in, in similar spaces as me is like, who is who is speaking the truth on that process? Because if you don't know, you feel like you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You feel like you're screwing up. You feel like you're not enough. You feel like you're behind. You feel like. I mean, the head trash, my head trash, like I could, you know, I could power a small country for decades <laughs> with my head trash if I could turn it into some sort of fuel source. Um, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Like that, it, it, like people just expect that it's always going to feel good or it's always going to be easy or it's always, if this is what I meant to do, it's just going to, I'm going to be energized by it. No, nah, it's going to beat you up and mm-hmm. exhaust you and make you want to cry and make you feel like a failure and challenge you in like, the most horrendous and crazy ways. And it's supposed to. Yeah. Right. But like nobody wants to hear that. But that's the process. Yeah. Like that is the process for output. Like output is not easy. There has to be that energy. There has to be that, that, um, I hate the word grind almost as much as I hate the word hustle, but there's just not a better word for it right now. So if all that's going on, which it is, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, the grind, the hustle, the self doubt, the mind, you know, the, the all mental of trash, all of it. So, one of the things you're, you're most passionate now in becoming a, a body language expert, I mean, you're featured on indie style here in town and on TV and all over the places. And, and with the passion of like helping people be most clued in about their confident selves, right. And to walk in any room, right. And actually present themselves as their best self. How do you do that when we're all still in some ways in our own brain in the process, right? We're in the grind, we're in the hustle, we got the mind trash, but like now I need to show up. I need to present in an authentic way, but in my best self. Yeah. How, how do you coach people to do that? Yeah, it's it's really um, it's it's one of those things that can't be manufactured, right? Like there's there's all sorts of tips around how to help people draw the right conclusion about you. So um, paying attention to how you're walking into a room, understanding that your first impression starts the moment that you're seen, not when you start engaging. Right. By the time you open your mouth, the jury's already in. Like so just that awareness of skills and how people's brains work and how we assess threat and leveraging that as as tools to help you with the mechanics of that experience Mm -hmm. are great. And I can teach that all day long. What I cannot fix if someone intrinsically in their head is not intentional about the experience they want to create for the person on the other side of them or the people on the other side of them. Mm -hmm. And they are eaten alive by all of that head trash and self-doubt and should I be here and who's going to listen to me? And they aren't equipped to get intentional around that doubt and do it anyways. I can't help you. Hmm. Like there's a million tactics. I work with my executive coaching clients are, you know, the most successful, impeccable resumes, 30, 40 years of of industry respect and experience and are are just killing it in every single way. And there is not a single person that I have ever worked with that does not question, are they the one to do the job? Mm. Or does not question, am I supposed to be in this room? Or does not question, who cares about my story? Who am I? Who am I to teach people this? Or who am I to to walk someone through this experience. Said in that imposter complex, right? Yeah, imposter syndrome. It eats us all alive. And and if you aren't at least aware of that, right? Yeah. We all have it. But if if you're not aware of that and you just feel know that you feel less than and you don't get intentional about showing up confident or competent or charismatic or warm or engaging or or however helps you move through that next experience then you're you're radiating like your internal GPS is already pinging on everyone else that I, I'm not going to invest in you or I'm not going to like you or I'm not going to appreciate you fully. So there's an internal like, and an external process. Absolutely. Yeah. And when people get because there's people that can like, 
you know, fake it or attempt to fake it. They have the mechanics of the body language and the nonverbal communication. The mechanics are impeccable. But that internal ping says, nope, Mm. then people don't trust them because you have created an incongruency. You're selling one thing, but people are vibing something else off of you. And so that incongruency, people won't think through that. They'll thin slice to the negative feeling. Like they may not even know, right? Like we have a hundred cognitive processes running in the background all the time. And they may not know exactly, oh, it was incongruency that caused me to not want to connect with you. They just know there's something about this person that doesn't match yeah, or something I'm not comfortable with or I'm getting something confusing from them based on what they're showing me outwardly and what they're expressing, you know, kind of intrinsically. And the guard goes up, the relationship gets harder. Everything that you went to do in that interaction gets more difficult. So in your journey, it sounds like it started, the internal journey started first for you, starting yeah. to take ownership of, you know what, I, I got to take my ownership of, of my part of, of the pain, of my part of, of how I got to, to the negative place, begin to rebuild that, and then you begin adding on the external parts of now how do I present the health and the strength that, that I know that I want, present my best self, right. and now how can I help other people do it? Right. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's the awareness of like a lot of people hurt themselves in situations and they don't even realize they're doing it. Like they're standing in their own way yeah. just because they don't have the awareness of how like they're they're creating an evidence trail that people can't do anything but land negatively about them on. So let's say somebody is is in a process of gaining some internal, um, you know, mental, emotional, spiritual health. Yes. What's what are some some of the most basic coaching tips you can give somebody on the body language side of things of like. I, I'm feeling momentum. Things are moving yes. in a good good place. Like, but I'm I've just I'm really feeling like I'm not having a connection with someone. What are some some like basic tips you can coach people up on? Yeah. So one of the most powerful things you can do is start an evidence file. Like I use the term evidence all the time because I'm also a forensic interviewer. So like evidence is important, right? Mm-hmm. And so, but the positive evidence file is all of the things that we discount or devalue because we don't believe them about ourselves, even though other people have made us aware of them, mm-hmm. right? So the emails of, hey, thanks so much for your quick response on this or for helping me solve this, the, the, the thank you notes, the, you know, it, all day long we're getting that positive evidence of you add value, you know, you're conscientious, you're a good person, you, you're capable of doing this all day long in lots and lots of ways, small and big forms. And people don't ever collect that, don't ever give merit to it, don't give any weight to that, mm. right? And that's partly how, I mean, our brains are like negative comments that we because if somebody, if I get one negative comment on a feedback form because I like feedback and I say that in air quotes because I want you to tell me I'm good, but don't tell me anything else, right? That's <laughs> yeah, really yes. what I mean. Yeah. Um, and I'll get 50, all five-star ratings, great comments, loved it, great presenter, blah, blah, blah. And I'll get one, like three, or I'll get one like someone who just didn't appreciate my personality. And there's always one. Yeah. Luckily, if, if, I'm, if I'm lucky, there's yeah. only one. <laughs> and then that's what I stew on. Mm that shades the entire experience as subpar mm. for me, right? Yeah. And and that's part of our brain. Like our, our brain latches on. There's a whole interesting chemical process with negative feedback, but it acts almost like a slow release tablet. Mm. Like it continues to recycle and recycle and recycle until it reduces. But it's like a 48-hour life cycle of a negative comment if wow. we allow it to root, Yeah. right? And so, so many people allow... That's like one negative instance or one negative piece of feedback. Like how many times do people just, even if it's not negative, we assume, oh, they don't like us or that didn't go well or whatever. Like we're self-inflicting that slow release suck tablet, right? Like that just keeps our brain in this spot of constant doubt. So creating tangible, like I will have clients actually like get a shoebox or a storage container and start literally putting things that you feel good about in it. You know what's funny you say that is it makes me think about, I remember in high school, and our band director had us, he, everybody had to create what he called a happy file. And it was literally, most of us had shoe boxes, and I did. And I found, this is crazy, this was, I graduated in 1996 from high school, so it had to be between 90, uh, 92 and 96. And uh, so that was a long time ago. And I just hey, recently. I graduated in 96 too. Watch it, buddy. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, well, I mean, we're not spring chickens here. But I found that happy file and it was, it's little things. It was notes from friends. It was, I mean, it was, I mean, it was from high school. Yeah. And I found it as a, you know, 40 year old man 
And literally. And how good did you feel, right? You're like, I'm the man. Yeah. I'm like, this made me happy this this many years later. So it's like the the need for that is so great. If something that is, you know, over 20 years old can still bring positive. I mean, things that are happening right real time, the, the power there is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's doing yourself the favor of acknowledging the good stuff, right? And however that is, whether it's an email file or whether it's, you know, a board on Pinterest or, I mean, whatever whatever your consumption preference is, like just giving yourself that, that continual evidence because there are, you're going to get beat up, right? So on a day when you get beat up or a day you get home at the end of the day and you feel like you haven't been seen and you're invisible, like take a minute and and reestablish yourself, right? And know that you're seen and know that you're valued, know that you're heard and know that it's just a day, yeah. right? And then propel yourself forward on that. It's really, really good. And I think, and I, and I don't think this this is, you know, something just for entrepreneurs or just for something for, for somebody in a pioneering space is that I think we all have, we all have that self-doubt. We all have that, yeah. that head trash trying to figure out and, and figure out how do I present myself in a way that is authentic but is, is based on, positive health and growth internally, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. So what, what's maybe an outward thing? At least I'm thinking about, I mean, you know, I mean, you have your basic stuff like make eye contact or whatever. I mean, yeah. but what, what are some like super bottom level, just easy things that are, that are outward body language things maybe people are missing on a day-to-day basis? Yep. The easiest thing and, and the easiest thing to even execute on is taking up space because your, so your emotions inform your outward physicality, but your outward physicality also informs your emotion, your emotions. And so when we. I've heard, so I've heard somebody say it like this. I've heard somebody say like your body, your body won't contradict itself basically. Right. So like you're saying. So like you're that, always leaking truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can fake it, but it's leaking somewhere in right. some, some way. And somebody who knows what to look for is going to see it and call you out. Um, Yeah. So, so taking up space is the easiest thing. It's just being aware of, you know, how are you walking into a room? Are you claiming as much space as you can? And I'm not talking about going in full on starfish, you know, Kool-Aid man style, but like just. <laughs> Hello! Right, right. Because then you get that, that you know, pings incongruent type problem that you create for people with that. But it's it's even, you know, a lot, I work in a lot of, uh, you know, mixed gendered executive teams and, and I'll look around and just freeze frame a meeting or a training. And I'm like, okay, so who's claiming space in this room? And it's almost always you know, on a space claim ratio, it's like two to one male to female. And so, and some of it is ingrained and socially taught and some of it is just intrinsically. But, but if you are only taking up as much space as like your, the width of your shoulders and everything's only like two feet in front of you and you have your nice little square box contained and everyone else is like lounging back and arm over the chair and their laptop and notepad and coffee's all over the place, right? Just the the perception of the power dynamic is that you are less than. Hmm. You are claiming less space than. You're being overpowered by, right? So I'm not saying go in and claim all the territory, right? But it's just a it's just something to be aware of. If you if you want to be seen as powerful, if you want to level the playing field, if you if you want to, um, you know, be perceived as confidence, just be aware of how much space you're taking and take more. Hmm. That's a, that's an easy way because that plays on people's perception of you too. Right. So so there's a, a study from the University of British Columbia that was done around um, and there's some some current ones that are reinforcing this done around victory and defeat. Yeah. And their kind of thesis was they wanted to see if um, people who were victorious and people who were defeated, if they responded physically the way they do, because it had been modeled of what winners look like, because what does a winner look like? Hmm. What is somebody who, you know, scores the winning touchdown do? What do they do? Throw their hands up. They get big. Yeah, they, they run around. Big, yeah. They claim all the yeah. space, right? Yeah. They do the end zone yeah. shenanigans happening yeah. now, right? Yeah. So what happens if you're, you know, the kicker that shanks the ball and loses a game? Like, they get small. They want to disappear. Yeah. Right? They take up as little space as possible. So mm. there's this interesting dynamic around how we feel intrinsically on worthiness, victory or defeat, and how we present physically um, in our space. And so they did, uh, they did a, a broad study. They followed... Um, athletes on 30 different countries in all different sports and athletes that had been blind since birth. So they'd never seen Hmm. victory or defeat modeled for them in in popular culture. And what they found was with those athletes is that they responded exactly the same as sighted athletes. When they were told they were a winner, 
They got big, grabbed space, claimed it all. Mm. When they were defeated, they got small, shrunk down, didn't feel worthy of taking up space. Wow. So it is an inherent, like, yeah. DNA-coded thing that the space we claim is relative to our feeling of worthiness in mm-hmm. that space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so just being aware of that and, you know, sitting a little broader or walking in a little taller or claiming a little more space at dinner or at, at a meeting, you know, all of those things is, and then you're telling your body, I'm confident and I'm worthy to be mm-hmm. right. So then intrinsically all of the good, all of the, the good physiological processes start reinforcing and buying into that story. Yeah. You know, I, I love what you're saying, the least. And for me, I mean, I, I, I guess I have to, I don't have to, but I, I choose to, and I, as a pastor, right, I process so much through a spiritual lens and, and even through a biblical lens. And I'm just thinking about like, you know, like when Jesus talks about, you know, the love of the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, like where everything is interconnected, like it, your body matters, your spirit, your mind, everything it connects and it makes me think about, you know, so often um, when we say it every week on the Born to Be podcast, we say it every week on Radio Theology, we say it all the time at the Spiritual DNA Workshop is that we believe you're created on purpose and for a purpose. And in, in that context, one of the things we focus on in the Spiritual DNA Workshop is helping you understand that when you get connected to a God that created you on purpose and for a purpose, one of the first things that he wants to begin to reshape and, and, and redeem for you is your understanding of your identity, that inner truth of who you really are outside of your performance, outside of your obedience, outside of you doing it all right, is that to begin to bring that inner peace and that inner confidence of that true identity in him and it's out of that that everything else flows. And so you present, even if it doesn't feel true in the moment, you present what is already true about you, not because of something you did, but because of what he's done for you. And if that's not something you've experienced yet, uh, get curious about the process, whether it's yeah. spiritually, whether it's mentally, whether it's emotionally, whether it's physically, um, because you were created on purpose and for a purpose. And um, you got to move, uh, make steps towards that. And I, I think the curiosity of that is key and coming from that in- inward place. Lisa, I love it. I'm intrigued. I want to know more. If somebody wants to stay connected with what's going on with Lisa Mitchell, how do they do it? Yeah, well, you can find me about everywhere because I'm I'm always loving to share my experiences and learning. So uh, powerbodylanguage.com is kind of my professional business Barbie kind of site that you'll find all sorts of videos and stuff on um if you want to know the real deal and what it looks like you know to like sit a jury for a murder trial per se like i did monday uh <laughs> follow me at lisa mitchell indy on instagram okay um and then also linkedin i do a lot of professional resources there so it's just at lisa mitchell so you're all over the place like you cannot get away from me i wonder I, I, <laughs> I, I uh i love it i love the journey you're like um, i know i've been trying for 15 years and no, yet here we are <laughs> no, not true uh, I love your tenacity and, and your curiosity, Lisa, and I, I'm excited about what you're creating now, what you're going to continue to create. Um, I know you've been inspired by the story. Get connected with what Lisa's doing and, uh, and begin to present your best self, the, the one that God has created, the one that God loves, the one that God redeemed. And, uh, and man, I tell you what, what the world really, really needs is you showing up as the, the person that God created you to be. And if you do that, we will see a world that's full of a lot more peace, a lot more passion, a lot more purpose. So, Lisa Mitchell, thanks so much for being on the Board and Be Podcast, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Born to Be Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. If you've got a question for Pastor Darren, a suggestion for a future guest, or if the podcast has made an impact in your life, get in touch with us at blackbirdmission.com. And if no one else tells you today, you were made on purpose and for a purpose. God is near to you, not far from you, and God is for you, not against you. Have a great week.